We're living in a time where the bizarre is seen and ignored. For once, fictional ideas are manifesting and becoming real. Where unspeakable cruelty is a way of life. Where both fake and real UFO examples confuse the public. Why the media ignores it. And where ancient prophetic texts Those letters make the name Obama. seem to be coming alive. There is a, another time-space continuum of which we are not aware. The first rule of Planet X research is the closer something comes to the truth, the faster it disappears. If you're believing that the Planet X is doing something to the Sun and the Sun is doing something to the planets, you are a dinosaur. This is um, half of uh, uh, an implant that came out of uh, a guy's wrist. Well, I can't count how many alien heads we've made. And one second later, it sounded like a loud explosion under the ground. And this wave just rippled out across the grass. He said, did we do that? And they are they awaiting their man, the Antichrist, to come forward. They already know who he is. In all the Watchers series, right from the get-go, we interviewed Dr. Roger Lear. He's been a mainstay of the Watchers series. In Watchers 1, UFOs are real burgeoning and not going away. Dr. Roger Lear takes us through the entire process. It starts when someone comes into his office complaining of something under the skin. Then an x-ray is taken. If the object cannot be identified, then Dr. Roger Lear decides to go in and operate. He uses a device known as a C-arm, which allows the surgeon to see exactly where the forceps are underneath the skin. Oftentimes these implants have a grayish covering over them, which sort of acts as a shield. The object is then placed under a scanning electron microscope, which also has an EDX feature, which allows the viewer to see what elements the material is made of. As we were shown new microscopic structures that were actually in the implants. And what was astounding is that while these implants were still attached to the person, they seemed to be giving off a radio frequency of about 300 gigahertz. In Watches 4, we postulated that these implants may in fact be changing the host DNA. Today we're headed to SEAL Laboratory with Dr. Roger Lear and Steve Colbert. Steve has routinely examined the implants and told us what these things are made from. Dr. Lear, great to see you again and it looks like you're recovering from uh, what has been ailing you. Well, you're absolutely uh, right, Len, and I'm uh, glad to be able to be here to uh, do another uh, Watchers uh, film for you <laughs> because uh, it was kind of a touch and go thing I had there for a while. Uh, I know folks that saw me in the last uh, uh, Watchers episode probably wondered uh, whether I just crawled out of the crypt or not. <laughs> <laughs> what is this sample you're running, Steve? This is um, half of uh, uh, an implant that came out of uh, a guy's wrist named Tim Cullen. He's uh, been an alien implant activist for some time now. Excellent. Looking at the, uh, the sample chamber inside the SEM uh, scanning electron microscope, and here's our sample holder, and um, on top of this black carbon tape is the sample. It's very tiny, um, only about a millimeter and a half long, and maybe at the most half a millimeter in diameter. And uh, we'll take an EDX of that uh, exposed end and uh, shoot the uh, sample at high magnification, and we'll see if uh, there's any carbon nanotubes on. Uh, the sample as there has been with uh, several previous samples. We're all pumped down in the uh, SEM chamber and high vacuum in there now, so we can turn on the high voltage and see what we can see. The black carbon tape that it's, that it's sitting on, Okay. and this is the cut end of the, um, the object. All right. And um, uh, this is the, uh, the, the size of the object that has the, uh, the coating on it that I mentioned before. It's 114 times. Keep going so we can see carbon nanotubes. You can't see carbon nanotubes generally until you're at about 30,000 times magnification. Wow. Single wall carbon nanotubes are only about a nanometer in diameter, and these are crystals of metal, apparently uh, 915 times. Now, when you're looking at this, you don't see anything out of the ordinary at not this right, level. Not at this level. Okay. No. Is it going to stay be the same as no, what's on the no, surface no, of the right. cut center? That was right there, so there, there should be no coating there. That's the cut end. 
So this looks like the, some of the coating here. It looks like it's rubbed off right here from the uh, the cutting process. Right where you got the X. What is that? Uh, that looks like just a cavity of some kind, but uh, the cavities tend to look really dark because the electrons don't tend to penetrate into them. You state that the carbon nanotubes that are in these implants would be excellent carriers of electrical current. Do you have any idea of why this should be and what or how it would affect the host? The carbon nanotubes are like um, graphite, which has a delocalized electrical structure. Um, uh, and a, a sheet-like structure rolled into a tube and um, the um, electronics of it work out such that the electrons are more free than in graphite and there's also there's metallic carbon nanotubes and semiconducting carbon nanotubes and the metallic ones have uh, a much higher conductivity than graphite or even most metals and um, uh, we're, we're looking into an earthly science um, uh, using carbon nanotubes uh, as electronic devices you can make uh, uh, transistors and diodes out of the mm -hmm. semiconducting uh, CNTs and uh, you can use the metallic ones as the wiring of the device. Since the body's an, an electrical system essentially, could yeah. the, you know, the, own, the, the, the host's electrical system be somehow powering these? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Lear thought that um, they were um, powered by the nervous system at first. Um, but uh, it seems more likely at this point that they actually um, are powered by zero-point energy. Uh, Dr. Kuntz and I were, were thinking that they were probably powered by, um, by zero-point energy. Uh, well, explain that. Energy what do you mean the by vacuum. that? Well, the, the, uh, the, um, the space-time continuum has tremendous energy in it, and over the years, inventors have found ways to tap this. There are several ways to tap uh, zero-point energy. And um, Dr. Kuntz thought that the certain frequencies given off by these devices um, could be used to uh, uh, generate zero-point energy and self-power the devices. Huh. And um, he thinks that they're perhaps giving off several watts of power um, in the radio scalar wave region. <laughs>
after they gained possession. They made an attempt to give the land back. The Muslims around them would go along with it and have peace with Israel, but because the Muslims wouldn't do it, Israel retained the land and began building settlements there. U.S. administrations would voice their disapproval, but nothing was ever pushed on Israel to stop the building of these settlements. Mm -hmm. That changed under Barack Obama. He actually added a condition to the negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Time and space uh, you know, has been uh, uh, provided for uh, Senator Mitchell and his team uh, to continue uh, dialogue you know, and uh, to see if there is a basis upon which the Israelis and Palestinians can make the decision to stay in these negotiations. But you have to have a, a settlement freeze in East Jerusalem before we're going to allow the negotiations to take place. So Israel balked at that and refused to go along with it for a period of time. But finally, uh, there was an announcement by the State Department that George Mitchell, the President's envoy, and he was to the Middle East, and he was envoy for Bush and uh, Clinton as well, was going to suddenly return to the Middle East. Days later, we hear reports that there's a de facto freeze, settlement billing freeze, in East Jerusalem. So it was reported by the BBC that the reason for a sudden uh, decision to go back was that the U.S. negotiating team had made some progress that indicated Israel essentially was going to give up uh, billing at that point in time for a period of time. Basically, they were going to freeze mm -hmm. the billing. Mm -hmm. So the best date that we can figure that that took place was April 20th, 2010. April 20th, 2010 is the day that the Gulf oil rig exploded. So, you know, it's again another coincidence. I have come to the conclusion that what we perceive as a timeline is, is simply an illusion. There is another time-space continuum of which we are not aware. I was uh, flying a Cessna 207, which is a, a cargo aircraft. When I was headed from Wichita, Kansas to Dallas, Texas, and from there to Lubbock to deliver some supplies for dealer meetings. So what happened when you were flying on that last leg of the journey? What did you experience? Give us the backstory. I uh, left about one o'clock. And in the afternoon. In the afternoon, and had uh, been in the air, climbed up to about uh, 4,500 feet, leveled off. It was a nice, cool, beautiful day, and I expected a flight of maybe a couple of hours to Lubbock, Texas. And uh, just as soon as I leveled off, a red light came on on the instrument panel. And you don't want a red light to come on the instrument panel. Either. So I quickly started checking and discovered that. Uh, I was not producing any electrical current, and, mm. and uh, I had a choice at that point to either turn around and go back to Dallas or fly ahead to Lubbock, and so I shut down the whole electrical system and headed for Lubbock, uh, because the engine, having its own electrical system, would keep me going. You're flying yeah. along, and you lose electrical power, and then shortly after that, you hear an audible voice. And the voice. voice was as plain and clear as your voice is right now, and the voice said, if you look to your left, you'll see a UFO. Just like that. Like that. It an announced itself. It, and I laughed. And I said, OK, I'm going to do it. And I <laughs> looked to my left. And about a mile away was a little bright light, like a star, flying at my same altitude and apparently about my same speed, mm -hmm. just right along with me. And I said, that's not a UFO, that's another airplane. And the sun is reflecting off its wings. And it just looks like a UFO. And uh, I noticed in, after a few minutes it was getting a little bit closer. And I figured, well, we're on a converging course. We must both be headed for Lubbock. 
That would put us together about that time. We both flew under a cloud deck and it got very dark. He still shone as brightly as, as if he were out in the sun. I said, wait a minute, that can't happen. Must be a UFO. And as soon as I thought that thought, this thing flew over right beside me. Whoa. And it came up to within about 100 feet of my left wing and, and parked there. We were flying in formation. And it was about uh, 100 feet in diameter, about, I figure, about 12 feet thick. Uh, it had beautiful, uh, a beautiful radial design of light, bars of light on the upper surface and on the lower surface, and, and it was just a thing of beauty. It was just the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life, and when <clears throat> I settled down after two or three seconds and looking at this thing, I, I that, that is the most wonderful thing I've ever been close to, and I felt this incredible elation or excitement and uh, almost a feeling of peace. In fact, all the time that it was beside me, I felt that it could penetrate my thoughts. I felt as though I were being probed or investigated. At the same time, I was elated. I had an incredible feeling of elation, like this thing is here to help almost, and I had no idea what that meant. So I was edging ever closer to it, and I was down to maybe 75 feet, 50 feet, That's very close. 25 50 feet, feet and, and I looked at it very closely to see if I could see any uh, rivets or right, fasteners okay. or sure. whatever. Right. And I saw nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> Seamless. Seamless. Like what material was Seamless. it made out of? Beautiful metal and... and uh, was it metal? It, it looked to, like a polished metal of some sort. Dull, shiny? Shiny. Very shiny. Just absolutely the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And. I got down, I think, probably within 25 feet of it, and at that point, it departed and in a hurry. In about less than one second, it went back to, the, to its original position, a mile south of me, and it banked the wrong way. It didn't even bank like an, an airplane will usually will bank this way. This thing banked the wrong way and, and scooted back to its original position, and there it flew alongside me. The next thing that happened was that I looked out the windshield and there was Lubbock Field. And right ahead of me, perhaps no more than 10, 12 miles away, and I thought, wow, we're here already. It seemed like it was too soon. But nevertheless, I flipped my power back on, <clears throat> had enough battery power to call the tower, make my landing. I landed at Lubbock, turned off the runway, went over to the Cessna dealership, turned the airplane off and looked through my windshield and I could look back to the east and there was this thing hanging in the sky waiting until I had landed. Is it possible that the space-time continuum as we know it, somehow the, those properties which we take for granted were changed so that what seemed to you like a few minutes because in, you, just, you just stated that oh wow, here's Lubbock, it shouldn't be here. That's right. From your perspective, and yet from the perspective of the Cessna guy, or the guy that's waiting for you, you're four hours late. Yes. Is it possible? I was in the air for something like, uh, if you go from 1.30, uh, maybe to, six, to as late as 6.30, that's, that's five hours. And that airplane- Can't only, do that. Can't do that, but four hours max. So what do you attribute that to? I have no idea. Uh, having thought about this for many, many years, uh, I have come to the conclusion that what we perceive as a timeline is, is simply an illusion. Mm -hmm. That is to mm -hmm. say there is a, another time-space continuum of which we are not aware. And uh, it can shift in and out of our dimension, and I actually saw it happen. I attribute uh, the hand of God to this whole incident because it, it was a mind-expanding, mind-opening incident for me that, that changed the course of my life. How can one discern one UFO from another? We know that 
that some of the occupants of these of these craft allegedly we, when we've talked to abductees yeah. you're taken your probe implants are put in and 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 the the people that are experiencing this experience exactly the opposite of what you've told us right not gladness not joy not a feeling of peace a feeling of great fear alarm evil all those how do we discern the difference is there any way that LA, you can point to uh, again I'm not an expert. I, I'm, I'm someone who had an experience. And, and no one is. <laughs> I had. No one is. I am a percipient and, and and not an expert. I was right in the middle of the whole thing, and I'm very subjective about what happened. But but my uh, view is that that yes, there are very dark forces. They are fallen angels. They have virtually the same capacities as the good angels who didn't fall. They are the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, the Bible speaks about. But there are also good angels. Mm -hmm, I'm sure. absolutely convinced of that, and I'm utterly convinced to my dying day this was one of them, and that I'm here today because of something that that good angel did. I want to show you this piece of footage that we've been talking about, and I'm anxious to show you. But before I do that, I just want to find out what your worldview is in the sense of, I mean, do you believe in some of these sightings that they could be authentic? I believe some of them have to be authentic, the sightings, okay. as opposed okay. to a lot of the lore and stuff that goes on with them. Okay. It's, a, it's a mysterious thing, for sure. It's intriguing. I know that... Um, at the outside, there are some huge problems with the whole phenomenon. Because, in my mind, again, from the lunatic fringe, why do these people care that are capable of interstellar mm -hmm. transportation? Mm -hmm. we, we're nothing. We're, it's like an amusement park or a museum down here. And, and, and the other things that, that, uh, that are interesting is, is, are, would the, is there any reason to believe that life forms would be anything like the ones that we see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they evolve on a planet that had the same gravity that ours does? Thus, you know, are they bipedal? Do they have mm -hmm. these big, you know, uh, there's so many unanswered questions, and yet the phenomenon is so universal worldwide. Jacques Vallée believes that these are... Uh, not interdimensional or not extraterrestrial beings, but they are interdimensional. They're coming through from some sort of another dimension. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, we're we're really off the reservation here. We don't. We really have no idea what we're looking at. No idea. Yeah, no idea. And they would so, have to be interdimensional. So you're a skeptic, but you're like a healthy skeptic. You're not. You're not. I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but you're not like closed to the idea. Oh, but you're cautious about whether whether it's. Or, but you're cautious of the reality of it. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've never been accused of being healthy, but we, <laughs> so, so let's. If, if you guys yeah. want to run in for a second, while we. Sorry. This this video um, appeared on the internet, um, April thirteenth, two thousand eleven. It appears to be like a blimp in the background. The the the, um, the film is very grainy. Then here we see what appears to be a UFO. We see it for about two seconds. Another shot of it again, and then this thing seems to crash. Now, let me just stop it right there. Did that. Did that frame, that UFO, let me see if I can get it back here. Does this look like like right there? Could that have been like a, an artifact inserted? Could that be the real thing? Uh, could someone be taking that and, you know, using real elements here and then doctoring you know, so it later? What do it, you think? It looks like it could be any of that. As, as a, well, the, the real thing, the, the one thing that's working for him particularly is the camera movement is so frantic and that covers a multitude of sins, as you all know. Um, the other thing is that the cameraman would be, would be attracted to whatever was going on and want to concentrate on it mm -hmm. and feature it. I mm -hmm. mean, you don't just, when you're a cameraman, you don't just let things whiz by frame, go, oh, what was that? You know, you always go to it and follow it and want to, mm -hmm. and, 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 and feature it and, sure. and move around. The time code is curious 
because I mean, from from the other from the looks of this being so archival and the the old film look, which now you can do on your they, did, they iPhone. didn't have they didn't have these type of time codes exactly. Yet. So but my question was was it edited after yes. the fact out of stuff yeah. that was yeah. really archival? And then the time code added later? Yeah, that's possible. It, it's it's just too curious. Another thing I noticed. Go ahead. Well, no, no another thing you notice is what. <laughs> Speaking of, of archival, the streaks and bubbles that happen mm -hmm. that, that make it look like it's, you know, eight mm -hmm. millimeter film that's 3,000 years old, um, they loop. They do. Yeah. Now here, here, here's something really curious. This guy has some very interesting recurring bubbles that I, I don't know where in, in old film unless, it, you know, the only time you see that happen is when they show the the projection has died and the film got stuck <laughs> yeah, right. and it melts in front of the sure. audience. It's got those strange little bubbles that that it shows up for a second and then it comes back again. So it, these artifacts could have been inserted like a, as an effect? I think it was an effect. Like in was, pose or something? Yeah, it's definitely a post Here effect. we've got the first real shot of, of some sort of a extraterrestrial biological entity, an EBE, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> and and it looks, you know, I mean to my eye, I mean, I you know, I'm, I'm not an expert here and it looks it's fooled me. I mean, it, it looks real. But then again, and here's, I'm, I'm, let me just stop it. So then we see some sort of wreckage. And then we see what appears to be EBE bodies, actually mm -hmm. terrestrial biological energy bodies on the, on the ground. And we have another close up. And right now, here it shows what appears to be um, a dead alien. The it's camera's just... only there for a few seconds and then it bounces away again. And, and, and that is a, a, just a tried and true. A Hollywood tactic is to never, you know, you don't study the alien. For example, the the, the blinking alien is, is a pretty compelling look. It's very organic, and you see his eyes close and open, and you can and see. And the it. hand flicks out. Yeah, but and it's 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 good enough. That that part is pretty compelling, but it's this it's it's the context of it that makes you think maybe it was a ultra low budget horror film seriously that somebody got the footage for and found it because other than that they I mean they did have a pretty good monster budget because they had three or four of these guys running around yeah. with their with their little right. uh, suits on because we make these suits all the time we made suits for people that wanted to do a, a Bigfoot hoax we made a big foot for the Bigfoot hoax, the guys. What's so that people, cost, though, to do something? Well, you know, the, this, we had a, a kind of a makeup creature effects studio for some time. And there are people that were, that were crazed about this stuff. They'd come mm -hmm. in and spend a thousand bucks a few years back to have, to have a piece that looked just like a Bigfoot and would leave the track and do all the cool stuff. And um, we do, I mean, the, the alien can't. Or I can't count how many alien heads we've made, much, sure. much like that, and you sculpt them and cast them and make a big head out of them, and this could even be that one, I don't know. But they, um, people want them, and they want them better and better. They'll pay a lot of money just for a, a great Halloween costume. Like if it's a hoax, I mean, it's, it's a fairly elaborate hoax. It is elaborate. Because they're using all of the mechanisms that a filmmaker will use to make a, a spooky or a intriguing mm -hmm. shot, mm -hmm. where they sweep across things and a hand comes across and the, you know the alien comes through and, and does. And, and you it, only get a glimpse for a, a second. Right. And it's not threatening. I mean, it's not dark. It's not spooky or anything. But it's like they are intentionally making it look like kind of cine verite news footage. about the device you invented for Arco to find natural gas underneath the ground. What, what motivated you to do that? Well, of course, I, I needed a degree. So <laughs> one of the subjects that was available uh, for undergraduates to take on in the physics department. So the, the phenomenon is that we kind of discovered it by mistake. We were out doing some surveying in oil and gas uh, area. Uh, oil and gas is very good at uh, supplying money to, to colleges for undergrads and grad students. So. 
We, we had these uh, uh, 25 meter radios that we communicated with in, in the field and they had some you know, good sized power to them. They're typically good for about five or 10 miles. We were usually eye, within eyesight of one another, less than a quarter of a mile apart. He gets on the four wheeler and rides back to me and the radios work. He gets over there, the radios don't work. So I said, what is going on? Where is all this radio energy going? We're broadcasting it, but it's not reaching the antenna. Mm -hmm. So I decided to hook uh, some equipment up to the antenna of the receiving radio to find out what's happening to that signal. When we got a distance away, it dropped about 90 dB. Whoa. What was left behind was this very strange wave shape. So I said, well, what is that wave shape? What, what are, what's going on here? What kind of phenomenon is happening? And over the, that year, what we discovered is that the petroliferous zone, what we call Wait, it. The, the what is that? The petroliferous zone. And what the is that? zone or layer under the ground that contains the oil. Okay. It actually works like a giant capacitor. It just absorbs all the RF energy. And we developed this radiometric device that could actually locate the depth of a, an oil zone under the ground. We could tell the thickness of it. We could tell the grade of the oil of Amazing. it. Amazing. And we could tell the depth of it. Wow. So that's where that invention came from. You know, we were contracted to go to Oregon. Uh -huh. We were contracted to look for a gas well for an individual who was uh, doing um, fescue farming. By that time, we had a camper that had the base unit in it, and the mobile unit was on an NATV, like a four-wheeler. Right. We sent out the four-wheeler. It got about um, 15, 1,800 feet away from the base unit, and I keyed down on the mic and said, go ahead and, and turn the unit on. So he turned the unit on, and about two seconds later, the camper just rumbled. Like, Whoa. Like something went off under the ground. So my mobile guy, Gary, calls back. He said, hey, did you feel that? I said, yeah, what was that? He said, I don't know. I, I turned the unit on, and one second later, it sounded like a loud explosion under the ground, and this wave just rippled out across the grass. He said, did we do that? I said, I don't know, but I mean, it's kind of like cause and effect. You, you turn the broadcast unit on, and the earthquake happened right then. So I started doing some research and sure enough, the frequencies that we were broadcasting were in the harmonic of what would resonate with a trigger to fire off an earthquake. With that in mind, is it possible that HARP, which we all know exists, um, somehow is manipulating the weather and also creating earthquakes. I get that question a lot about the high frequency active auroral research project. It was originally invented by Bernard Eastland as for the Navy. It was a seven part uh, patent process. And Bernard and I uh, got to meet each other. I had published a paper about this earthquake event that I had related to you. And I didn't know anything about HARP at that time. So once Bernard briefed me on what HARP was capable of doing, I said, well, you know, Dr. Eastland, what frequencies are they are they working with and when he told me what frequencies they're very similar to what we were using I said no 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 you, you don't realize the risk you're running Whoa. using those carrier frequencies I know I've spent years in the field with this hmm. and it, it has a resonance effect that uh, can cause a terrible backlash called call it an ionospheric breakdown we have finally settled on a name called a solar tap which uh, you know how lightning works charge builds up in a cloud 50,000 feet high and it's somewhere around five or 6,000 feet off the ground. And then the ground builds an ion path up to the cloud and then the ions discharge from the cloud to the ground. And they'll pulse like 10 or 15 times a second until the resistance gets so high that the pulse stops and then the, the bolt goes away. But that bolt is about the size of your arm and it's only about 5,000 feet. The ionosphere is about 40 kilometers to 80 kilometers up. It's insulated from the Earth by distance. But if you keep pouring energy into it, it keeps charging up and charging up and charging uh, up. Now, it will put out light. That's what we call the aurora. Sure. We have one in the north and one in the south, and sometimes it reaches you know, pretty close to the equator. But there's no ground path from the ionosphere to the Earth. That's what worries me about HARP. This is a focused array of frequency that's beamed up at the ionosphere, designed to push it out into space like a giant parabolic mirror. Mm -hmm. That's what it's designed to do. That mirror is then used in the Marconi effect to direct ELF or ULF 
frequencies to wherever they want to on the planet. Extremely low frequencies. Right, or ultra low frequencies. Okay. And they're used for various things, for x-raying the earth, like to look for oil and gas, which can also cause the earthquakes, as I already spoke of, or to communicate with submarines, or to redirect weather systems. And I've demonstrated how it can do that on a smaller level. But the scary thing is that this beam, if it's high enough power, can form that ion path, which means once the ground wire is laid between the ionosphere and Earth, you get a discharge, like a bolt. Only it's not a bolt the size of your arm. It's a bolt one or two kilometers in diameter. We need some civilian oversight with HARP because what you're playing with is like worse and more unpredictable than the hydrogen bomb. You're working on a documentary um, where you're go about to make an expedition to the North Pole to either prove or disprove uh, the hollow Earth theory. There was this idea that planets form as hollow spheres, that mm. some of the ancient tribes retreated into the interior of yeah, the I've Earth. Yeah, I've heard that, sure, sure. There were explanations of Noah's flood that involved, you know, the cracking of the crust and the, the fountains of the Earth opening up and sure. water coming out. And, you know, I too, because I'm classically educated, thought it was a myth. So this is just nuts. Everybody knows that we live on a molten ball in the blackness of space. Everybody knows we live on continents that float around on this molten ball, like cornflakes in a bowl of milk. <laughs> We've been taught that our entire lives. It makes complete scientific sense. Except some of the data doesn't align with that theory. So I said in 2005, well, somebody's gone up there. Somebody's sailed up there and photographed it or knows about it. No expeditions. No one had ever sailed there. Now it's been flown over and ostensibly uh, Admiral Byrd flew over it and reported that he saw lush green yeah, right, you right. know, places where none should have been, certainly. So it was one of those little kind of sand in the balance kind of thing. <laughs> the balance is over right. here, you know, right. molten ball. Everybody yeah, knows that. Everybody knows but that. over the years, you know, it started tilting a little bit more, a little bit more. One of my ancestors is Sir James Ross. He discovered the North Magnetic Pole in 1831. Wow, fascinating. He also named a curious little seagull. We call it the Ross Go. Why is it curious? Because it flies north for the winter. It's not built like a penguin. It's just a little seagull. It can't take 80 below weather. It must not be 80 below somewhere where this bird nests over the winter. With all that's going on in the Middle East right now, we see this, this tension um, and we see from the Ezekiel 38 passage that the nations which are named very specifically in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy seem to be forming the stages being set perhaps for the fulfillment of this prophecy. What you have here is the following. You have here the story to go towards Gog, perhaps uh, you will translate it uh -huh. uh, in your way. And Gog Meshach. the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach Tubal and the prophecy against him. Which in Hebrew, those letters make the name Obama. <laughs> Obama. Which no doubt, it, as we know today, that his impact is definitely goes all over the world. All nations in the world, in fact, are connected with him because he really decides how things will go. But in this case, really, you did not need a computer. Because right, it's, computer just, it's just right it's there. Exactly so it's exactly. actually in the plain text. In the plain text. It's yeah. in the plain, the plain text. text. And also written fully because the name Obama, I have here full letters. Really, because Obama can written also with that one letter. You see, there is a letter here which is really not necessary. His name really being here with the chief, Nassim, in Hebrew is chief, with those nations which coming afterwards. What are the Meshach, nations? Tubal, Persia, Iran, which is Persia is Iran, uh, Ethiopia, Libya with them, yeah. Togarma, which is could be Turkey. Turkey yeah. Let me ask you something. You, you, we off camera we were talking a little bit, and and you were saying that a, a rabbinical tradition would be that that Gog and Magog can shift. But the idea is that there are potentials every generation, in fact. Hmm. Yeah, so Gog from one side and Messiah from the other side, amazing. Huh. 
You see, so huh. I said in our time, Ahmadinejad can easily be could like be a god. Yeah, because uh, you see, this is what he wanted so to do. So with that in mind, the... Hitler was, was a type of Gog. Yeah, some say. A exactly, chief prince. Hitler, exactly, some say that this one, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. You see, so it is amazing that every generation you had something uh, like this, you see. Dan, last time you were with us, you mentioned that Israel has no idea who it is she's dealing with on a month-to-month -month basis. Would you still hold to that point of view, or has that window narrowed a bit? No, even more so than it was before. Um, if you look to the south, um, the situation in Egypt has so radically changed since the last time we talked. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we talked, it looked as if there was a military council that was going to permit some sort of uh, an election, but that the military behind the scenes would assume the role that the Turkish military uh, assumed under Ataturk, which was the military will be the guarantor of democracy, and if we see a government that's becoming too Islamist, that was the role of the military in Turkey. The, it was the army that was to safeguard democracy. And so you had the military obviously looking out for its own self-interest, but they were at least saying, that's going to be our role. We will safeguard the, the, the new democracy. Um, and then you had uh, a Muslim Brotherhood candidate win, who said, I'm really not going to follow the agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I'm going to be working with the military. And all of a sudden you had these attacks in Sinai in which a score of, uh, or more, of Egyptian soldiers were murdered at their posts by Islamist terrorists supported by elements from uh, Gaza, from Hamas. One car, according to statements from the Israeli Prime Minister's office, was packed with explosives and went off short of the Israeli border. The second was destroyed in an Israeli Air Force strike. There were heavy patrols on both sides of the border into the morning hours, and attention from Israel and Egypt is likely to linger in the Sinai, an area considered as, quote, the Wild West. And it looked as if the Egyptian people and the military were saying, you know what, this terrorism now is directed against us, and we're going to crack down on it. And so all of a sudden, the pendulum shifted, and you thought, well, that's, that's really interesting. All of a sudden, they could be in the forefront of the war against radical Islamists because they've now been stunned. Within 48 hours of that, Mercy, the, uh, the new president, carried out a complete purge of the military, replaced all of the old Mubarak holdovers, a new cadre of officers loyal to the Muslim Brotherhood springs up, and inside of 48 hours, the pendulum that had swung this way swung 180 degrees back. Nothing will get better in terms of Israel and whatever country it is, relations. It can only stay the same or get worse. Mm. So we've taken a step back and waited to see what happens. Egypt's newly elected president, Morsi, uh, is backed by the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Imam Higazi has stated that Jerusalem will be the capital of the new, newly created United Arab States. Um, with the recent Gaza incident uh, in mind, and Egypt calling 60 tanks up to her border and deposing generals which had been um, in power since the Mubarak regime. Um, what will be Israel's response to that? What should be Israel's response to that? Yeah, it's a very unfortunate development. Mubarak had Western influences. His military was Western trained. Mm -hmm. They had a respect for the United States, for the West, and for Israel. And with the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood to power, it's really going to be interesting to see what's going to happen. Obviously, they are not going to control the borders and to allow radical extremists mm -hmm. to cross over and potentially bring uh, bombs and, and weapons that are a real uh, threat, threat to Israel. And so I think there's a real concern about an escalation occurring and Israel could, could possibly be facing a conflict on multiple borders, a mm -hmm. multiple, a multiple uh, front uh, attack. Do you think we're looking at the formation of World War III? Absolutely. And it's been said by modern historians that the major wars of the 20th century were fought
to bring Israel to the position that Israel now occupies. Or to put it another way, Middle East politics have been formed by World Wars I and, and II in the 20th century. The, the First World War basically awarded the land to Israel through the Balfour Declaration. Sure. Uh, World War II took the people back to the land after the Holocaust. And uh, modern historians feel, and, and I tend to agree with this, that World War III will be brought uh, into play uh, in order that the modern Israelis can form uh, a new government. Bashar al-Assad still manages somehow to retain power in Syria. What do you think the outcome of this ongoing civil war will be? The world's attention is being focused on the city of Damascus right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the city of Damascus is, has become a, a, a focal point uh, for politics, Middle East style. So at the same time, you've got Assad who to hold on to power uh, has killed 20,000 of his own people. But he hasn't just killed 20,000 of his own people. He's done it in such a way to inflict maximum terror. It isn't just numbers, it's how do I get the point across to you folks not to do this, and you recently had 50 children murdered, bodies stacked like cordwood, that you, someone who does that purposely, and it's not an accident, does it to make a point. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll kill your children. Sure. I'll come after your family. Sure. That's a very Middle Eastern message. This was a cluster bomb dropped on Dar'a last July. If we needed any further proof of the Syrian government's complete disregard for the lives of its own citizens and its own children, well, here it is. Because we know now that the government is using uh, cluster munitions in populated areas. And of course, these weapons are extremely dangerous for the civilian population and the children. They first detonate in the air and they release bomblets over large areas, sometimes dozens, hundreds of them on the, an area the size of a football field. And, and these bomblets, uh, when they don't detonate on impact, uh, remain active. And the problem is, and you can see it on, on some of the videos coming out of Syria, that civilians and children play with them and handle them in a completely unsafe way because they think uh, they will not detonate, but often they do, and in the process killing uh, people. As we're speaking, uh, the events of the world seem to be shaping up into an imminent war. Uh, once again, the Russians have pulled out of the uh, deep water seaport of Tartus. They've taken their warships, uh, their military supplies, even pulling their aircraft and some of their uh, surface-to-air missiles back toward Russia uh, because they sense that war is imminent and they have been warned to stay out of it. Israel is, a, is practical above all else. They are very pragmatic and they will deal with what they have to deal with. I don't think they're governed by emotions or emotional responses. Uh, they're perfectly content to be hated. They've been hated for centuries and they're used to it. Mm. And I don't think it'll affect their, their planning in the least. They plan on a pragmatic groundwork rather than an emotional groundwork. And there's a part of Isaiah where he says, and it's a st the first time I read it, it, it was startling because he says, you know that I'm talking to you in a different age about things that I could not possibly know that no one around, I'm paraphrasing, but it's that no one around me gets, but you get it. And I thought, good Lord, you don't have to worry about the Bible codes, it's there. Yeah. Bush Jr., when he was a governor, came out to Israel and was taken by then, uh, also similar to a senator, Ariel Sharon. Uh. Ariel Sharon, the general, took up Bush, the, the governor, up in a helicopter and flew him over Israel. Now, it's a helicopter ride that takes about 45 minutes. There you go. I mean, Israel's tiny. Right. And he was up in the air, and he showed him. He showed him the, 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 how the land works. He showed him the border of seven miles, which, which is just between Tel Aviv and Netanya. This is like central. This is like Manhattan, right? It's indefensible. Uh, indefensible. Yeah. And he got it, and he understood it. And until people come to Israel and understand that, and get what's going on, it, it, it's very, very, very difficult to explain.
So what are we looking at in, in, in this area? Well, here's one of those pits that I pointed out before. Mm -hmm. It looks even more regular under high magnification. We're at about uh, nearly 21,000 times now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not seeing any obvious carbon nanotubes, but these pits are interesting. So we'll see. We're um, 1,500 atoms wide. Okay, that's still that's really still small. Still really small, yeah. Do the samples show magnetic properties? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's taken off. Now, it, and this this is very deliberate. I mean, would you find this in nature, anything like this in nature? No, I, I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, certainly nothing that... that so who, without putting science. words in your mouth, whoever created this, whatever it is, mm -hmm. this seems to be very deliberate, this coating, yeah. so the body doesn't reject the implant. Is that, that could be one of the functions. This here might be one of the um, the main connection to the device I was talking wow. about. The we're, we're nerve bundles. endings from the host would come in and maybe connect to this. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, we probably ought to. Um, you have point and shoot on this. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can tell if that's organic. Yeah. Uh, that's probably one of the main connections to the device that I've seen in like four implants now that. that carbon nanotube bundles about 10 microns across. They show a carbon nanotube signature in Raman spectroscopy and an EDX, as you can see here. They're mostly carbon. Uh, that's the wire and, um, that's plugging in. That's the wire that's plugging it in, that's plugging it in. exactly. And it, this, this connects to the, the membrane on the outside that Dr. Lear discovered in his research, the gray conductive membrane that's very hard to cut through with a scalpel. Give us the backstory. Where this, where this little piece of metal came from. A fellow from uh, eastern Colorado, a very small time, uh, town uh, by the name of Yuma. He and his wife, who happens to be an RN, were traveling from Denver, you know, across Colorado back to Yuma again. And it was about uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, oh and they were driving <laughs> a truck. And it was uh, a typical, you know, lonely uh, Colorado road. But anyway, they saw a light. In back of him, and he turned around to his wife and said, uh, I think there's a truck behind us, you know, uh, take a look because he's coming at a great neck speed, you know, and this, you know, could be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. So she turned around and she said, uh, well, it's awful bright and it could be a truck and boy, you're right, it's, it's coming right along. So it um, came rather rapidly towards the rear of the car mm -hmm. and then suddenly slowed down and almost stopped and then paced the car. Well, uh, for lack of a, a, a right or wrong thing to do, uh, he decided to pull over to the side to let whatever it was pass. So he did, he pulled over to the side and they, uh, uh, as soon as they did that, the object, which was a round uh, uh, craft, a saucer-shaped craft, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. flew over the vehicle towards the right, crossed the road in front of them, and came down uh, into a field, an empty field. And it just hovered there above the ground. And wow. uh, of course, he being the driver, uh, rolled down the window and was looking out uh, at the craft as well as was the wife. And the next thing you know, he claims that two lights came on consecutively, one right after the other, mm -hmm. and flooded the inside of the car with, with light. And then the next thing he remembers is that uh, he's uh, got his hands on the wheel, and they're driving back down the road, and they have no memory of anything mm -hmm. that went on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got home, and they had uh, two young daughters and a babysitter, and uh, the reaction from the babysitter was, uh, my God, where have you been? And they said, well, you know, what are we talking about? What are you talking about? You know, we just you know, came back from Denver. And she said, oh, it took, you know, seven hours to get back from Denver? You know, you're only like two, two and a half, three hours away. Oh, no, it isn't. They said, you know, it's only been a couple hours. And they looked at their watch and there was, you know, miss, uh, missing time. Bit missing time. Wow. You know, we've heard a lot about Planet X. Uh, it's on it's on YouTube, it's on the internet, people are talking about it. It's on shows like Coast to Coast, there's different authors who have written books on Planet X. Is it real? Is it uh, fantasy? Is it, you know, the product of an overactive imagination? We know that Zechariah Sitchin wrote books about Planet X. It's hard to bet some of this stuff, but you know what? We figured that you'd be interested in it like we're interested in it. So we went up 
to see Mr. Planet X himself, Marshall Masters, who's written books on this, who's studied it, who's talked to a whole variety of people. And I gotta tell you, um, I'm interested to see what Marshall's gotta say. Doing my show. Yellow Yelsa subscribers and listeners at large. Marshall, the people watching, many people hopefully watching, uh, will have not have a clue as to what Planet X is. Just give us a summary of what Planet X is and why should we care. Planet X is a generic term for an object that we know is out there by the way it interacts with other objects in our solar system. The conversation about Planet X, the unknown object, has been going on since the 1950s. As a matter of fact, Carl Sagan wrote about something like this in his book, Comet. It, it is an object that is in an elliptical orbit, steeply inclined to the ecliptic, the plane of our solar right. system, and it's approaching from the southern skies. Other than ancient Sumerian texts, what other historical sources can you point to which discuss and, and talk about Planet X. It is well documented in a great deal of ancient folklore and history. It's uh, discussed at length in the Holy Bible, but also in the Colburn Bible, the Sumerian texts. There's a lot of history. In the Kabbalah, you find the discovery of new stars in the sky before the end of time. Very interesting. We were looking at evidence of the perturbations of Planet X. Now, have there been observations of it? In 2006, I broke the story on the SPT, the South Pole Telescope, which from our standpoint is the perfect instrument at the perfect place to observe this thing for many years. And that was brought in clandestinely, somewhat clandestinely. I don't want to use the word conspiracy here, but what, what did you discover with, with the South Pole Telescope? You're talking about a Berlin airlift kind of a scale operation to get this down there. There was a stated scientific purpose, but the fact was that same science could have been done in Chile for a fraction of the cost of putting a telescope into the most hostile environment on the face of the planet. The South Pole. Right. The dish itself was made by a Dutch firm. And I was working with Dutch physicist Jaco van der Warp so he could read all of the specs in his own native tongue. Mm -hmm. And once we reported on that, those pages disappeared. And like I said, the first rule of Planet X research is the closer something comes to the truth, the faster it disappears. When you say disappeared, what do you mean? How, how, how did, who took them? Where, where did they go? They just go? disappear. Boom. Pages disappear. Knowledge disappears. People disappear. Things just go away. Uh, Marshall, I'm going to read to you something uh, which I uh, discovered in my research on Planet X. Um, so bear with me. The Hopi predict a 25 year period of purification followed by the end of the fourth world and beginning of the fifth. The Mayans call Planet X the end of days or the end of time as we know it. The Maoris say that as the veils dissolve, there will be a merging of the physical and spiritual worlds. The Zulu in Africa believe that the whole world will be turned upside down. There's our pole shift. The Hindus, Kali Yuga, end time of man, they also believe in a critical mass of enlightened ones that will come. The Incas call it the age of meeting ourselves again. The Aztec call this is the time of the sixth sun, a time of transformation, creation of a new race. The Dogon in Africa say that spaceships are the visitors. There's that whole Zechariah Sitchin theory. We'll return in the form of a blue star. Pueblo Indians in the, in the Americas acknowledge it will be emergence into the fifth world. The Cherokee, their ancient calendar, ends exactly at 2012, as does the Mayan calendar. The Tibetans' teaching uh, predict the coming of a golden age. Egypt, according to the Great Pyramid Stone calendar, presents this cycle, ends in the year of 2012. The point being is you've got peoples from all over the globe pointing to 2012 as some sort of an event. Is this just a coincidence or something more? What we're finding is a tremendous amount of obfuscation. Deliberate obfuscation. Deliberate 
obfuscation, but this is a consistent pattern all the time. Guess what's happening? There's a planet that's coming to Earth, and when it happens, it may create a pole shift, and we're expecting about 90% of all life on this planet mm -hmm. to cease, which would cause complete pandemonium and, and total craziness. So, I mean, I understand that if something like this is really coming in and they know about it, they'd have to keep this thing under wraps. First class gets the boats, steerage goes down with the ship. We are steerage. The whole point of this is to reduce the population of the planet for the benefit of the elites so that A, they can make their getaway, and B, so that they have a much more manageable planet to come back to when they return to the surface. Uh, so for those of us that are left on the surface, it's going to be catch as catch can. Um, with Planet X. It's, some people believe that this thing is real, that it's out there, that it's coming, and others think it's a lot of hooey. So, you know, I'm, I'm anxious to pick your brain on this and uh, find out what you think and what your position is. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely probably in the hooey camp. There. Okay, that's good. Uh, an AU is a distance from the, from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, Mike Brown, who is the guy who basically demoted Pluto recently, is an astronomer um, that, said, that said something interesting about, about this idea that, that a, an object can come and into you're our you're solar system. You're going to read this now from This from is a Mike quote Brown, okay. from Mike Brown. He says this, There's a, There are very good limits to what you can hide and at what distances in the solar system and not detect their gravity. You could put a Mars at a few hundred AU, which is ten times more distant than Neptune, say, and everything would be fine. You could put a Jupiter at a few thousand AU, which is a thousand times the distance of Neptune, and again, you're safe. There might even be things out there that someday we might find. I certainly hope so. This is interesting. He says, it's not impossible that the sun is a brown dwarf companion, but to be hidden from us, it would have to be much, much further out than the Kuiper Belt, maybe like a hundred times further. Describe to us the difference between um, the sort of end time scenario found in the book of Revelation, compare that to what the 2012 verse is saying. Uh, that's a good question. I think that the, the the primary thing in my mind is that you have, with with the Bible, you have something that is saying this event is unparalleled in history. Uh, this is not speaking of like a um, something that has come every 3,600 years or something like that. It's a one-time show, one-time Every event. living thing in the sea dies. All the vegetation is destroyed. That is a one-time thing. The Bible itself goes into many times, says this is going to be like nothing that's ever happened before, not since your father's, not, I mean, it, it makes these constant references that this is unique. In addition, the, 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 the judgment in the Bible is always referred to as uh, targeted, specific. It's against the wicked. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord. It's always against the wicked. A lot of people are wondering about Nibiru, so they're shooting pictures with various types of cameras, so we thought we'd do a test to see if we can generate the same kind of artifacts. Uh, one is the uh, ever so popular uh, Apple iPhone 4S, and along with that I brought a, a piece of welder's glass with me, which is good to kind of knock down the power of the sun, but the iPhone's doing a great job with the sun just by itself without anything in front of it. And now what I'm going to do is I want to put a piece of Walter's glass in front of the lens on the iPhone. And we end up with this very interesting artifact, kind of like what people are seeing, uh, like a white object to the left side of the sun. If I look through this Walter's glass with my eye at the sun, there's nothing there. I can see the sun just fine and the object to the left is not there, does not exist. We're going to use a Hero 2 cam from GoPro and I'm clipping on the little monitor on the back of it. I'm just going to hand hold it like, like the little camera that it is. I'm going to turn it on and I want to do the same exact test with it. First of all, the sun's going to look way smaller because the lens is a super wide angle on these cameras. Now I'm going to put this over it and basically it's giving me, you can see a reflection of the lens on the back side of the, of the plate. Very interesting. I'm being very careful not to hurt the lens. But there it is. And it's actually showing us the curvature of the lens. And uh, basically it just shows the sun. It's 
Okay, this is another camera. This is a, uh, a DSLR, Canon 60D. Now I'm shooting the sun. I don't have any filters in or anything like that. I'm shooting at 100 ISO at 22 f-stop. I'm just shooting the, the sun where it is and I, and I have an optical flare that's moving around as I move the camera. It is a, definitely a flare, but it, what's interesting, it's just one little pinpoint of light that I'm getting in shooting it just with this lens. Now this is an 18 by 135 lens. And I've zoomed in on the sun. You, you can see the water and I'm tilting up to the sun. Now I'm going to take the welder's glass and this lens is pretty flat on the front so I can put the glass right over. And if I hold it real still, you can see it just looks like my eye does, where there's just the sun there. There's nothing else by the sun at all. It's faithfully reproducing the actual sun. The onset of all of this, in my book, Crossing the Cusp, I'm documenting a crop circle that appeared in Abbey in 2008. I'm familiar with it. What it's also telling us is that there's going to be a massive solar event that is going to literally whack us. I'm trying to get it on my video. Yeah, video, 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 video. Wow. <laughs> Have you ever seen one before? This is also consistent with the warnings of NASA, NOAA, and National Academy of Sciences. Experts say Solar Max is due in the year 2013. When it arrives, the peak of the 11 year sunspot cycle will bring more solar flares more coronal mass ejections, more geomagnetic storms, and more auroras than we have experienced in quite some time. And uh, the it could affect the electrical grid and, and yeah, it's, it's going to take down the National Academy of Sciences is saying you know we're concerned it could take down uh, over a hundred million homes. I saw you on Brad Messler's uh, on the History Channel decoded. I was just blown away by the information that you were sharing. Well, the one thing that always bothers me about that, and it bothered me at the time when it was going on, is people think that I'm trying to tell a story about myself. Mm -hmm. The story has nothing to do with me mm -hmm. any more than it has to do with the car that I drove in or the places where we stopped and conversations were had with the VIPs or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're the story. Mm -hmm. The spear is the story. The uh, other things that people do are the story. Uh, I look at it like a, a dumber version of Forrest Gump just being in, in places that were not really good places. But it allowed me to see things and hear things and experience things that otherwise wouldn't come to light or people wouldn't know about. What is the Spear of Destiny or more commonly known as the Spear of Longinus? There are the three reported spears and there's the one that I talked about okay. uh, that you contacted me about. The one that the, uh, the three all have in common is they all have a nail. And that and nail is from? From the crucifixion of Christ, wow. one in each hand or forearm and one through both feet. Okay. The one at the Vatican, uh, one in the Habsburg Museum, mm -hmm. and one that, controlled by the Eastern Orthodox Church somewhere. Right. Uh, the one thing all of them have in common is a nail embedded in it. Just like there were three nails in Christ, each one of them has a nail. Okay. The one that I talked about the story that I was told and the things that I saw go to a completely different spear. And the spear that I was told was the actual spear of Longinus that pierced the side of Christ doesn't have a nail in it. It looks completely different from the rest. It looks like a whole actual spear and its history dates all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So in other words, this is a story that you were told. Yes. When I was first retired from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, back in 1984. I got busted up on the job and I was retired. Uh, I was a chauffeur bodyguard for a number of people and for more than one company. Okay. One of the people that I worked for, one of the bosses that I had, 
Um, obviously, they were all wealthy. Obviously, they were all powerful. One of them was more powerful than all the rest. He's the source for a lot of the material, from things that I saw when I was with him, things that I heard when I was with him, his conversations with other people, with heads of mm -hmm. state. Presidents. President, uh, prime ministers, other people like that. Uh, there was also someone who accompanied one of the VIPs, who initially I thought was Secret Service, wound up not being officially secret. He was in one of the alphabet soup groups, which one I have absolutely no idea. Met me at the Redwood Bar, which is close to, it's in downtown. Okay. Uh, two or three nights in a row, and then a couple of times after that. Uh, and proceeded to tell me more in depth the story that I'd been getting bits and pieces. Did you feel like you were being initiated into something? Yes. Okay. This is the way they talk. The three spears all have power. Each one of the ones that has a nail because each one of them pierced Christ, had the blood of Christ on it. This is what they believe. Any one of the spears has power if it's in the right hands. So some of them believe, you know, the one that went through the right hand is more powerful because it's the right hand, the other than the left hand. No, the one that went through the feet because it went through two parts. But they believe that they had this power. And they truly believe that Hitler, when he looked at the one in mm -hmm, Habsburg, had mm -hmm. the visions and all the rest of that sure. and saw right. all of that. And it, it really caused him to be possessed and to be able to have the power to do the things that he did. We know historically that when Hitler went into Austria, the first thing he did, the first act that he did, was to take the spear and the crown jewels yes. out of that museum, correct? Yes, that's correct. There is another political family that was very interested in that spear, who wound up having uh, a son become president of the United States. And Are you at liberty were, to say who no. that is? Okay. Uh, they were very interested in that spear. Uh, and it actually, the story again that I was told, my boss had been in Germany prior to the, is it Anschluss? Prior to the mm -hmm. annexation of right. Austria. Yes. Um, and had swapped spears. Who swapped spears? My boss had. How did he have access to that? Don't know. Powerful people. In Trevor Ravenscroft book, he claims when Hitler first saw the spear, he was became obsessed with it. Uh, it. It changed his life, literally. Did your boss ever comment on Hitler's obsession with the spear? Yes, he did. Uh, made the comment that it was what was used in any sense to give Hitler his power, to indoctrinate him into the occult, to open him up for demon possession, to open him up for the things that gave him actual power. The people, my boss said, the people that would, had been around him would describe him like a limp dish rag, a wrung out dish rag right. after he had given a speech or had done something. It was like something came into him and then left and that it was the spear that had done that. Was your former boss also an adept or a practicing occultist to the best of your knowledge? Did he ever dabble in this stuff? To not the, the way you would think, okay. and not the way that other people would think. Someone who is a true Luciferian does not consider Lucifer to be Satan. He doesn't consider him to be fallen. He doesn't consider him to be bad. He doesn't consider his works to be evil. It's flipped. It's flipped. Yahweh's the bad guy. Yahweh is the, he's the evil guy. He's the bad guy who wants to condemn. Lucifer is the light bringer. It's what his name means. Sure. He brought light to mankind. Whether you take the Prometheus myth, whether you, what it, the, every religion has got him. Every ancient history and mythology has got the people that brought light, brought fire, brought light, whatever, and knowledge to mankind, which is a good thing. That's how we look at it. How, did, how do we make the leap from the guy in the bar talking about the spear and your boss telling you about it? Did you just go to him and question him? Hey, this guy at the bar told me that you got the Spear of Destiny. How, how, was, that, how was that bridge? Yes. Eventually, yes. I didn't do it right away. Right. I mean, at the end of the first night, oh, dark 30, whatever time it was, <laughs> when we shut the bar down, right. the two of us, uh, it's right across the street from where he had told me it was. And I'd seen it many times. Huh. So it's hidden in plain view, at least then. Plain sight. Plain sight. Did you ever touch the spear? Did you ever see the spear, touch it, look at it, handle it in any way? What would you do? I mean, that was a question that I've been asked a couple of times. Right. 
Did you go look at it? Well, yeah, of course I did. Did you go touch it? Of course I did. What happened? <laughs> not a thing. <laughs> not Nothing. A thing, right. Nothing. I'm not an adept. I'm not an empty vessel to be taken by somebody else. It doesn't mean it was the spirit. It doesn't mean it wasn't the spirit. Right. I have no idea. No idea. Some of your viewers, this isn't going to make any sense to. You'll understand. I carried a briefcase for his phone. It was that big to have a phone. We had sure. a phone in the car. It and, had, and what year is this roughly? Between 84 and Yeah, 87. so there's no cell phones as no. we have them, right? No, it was, it was a briefcase right. for a phone. We right. had a phone in the car. It had 85 batteries, car bat, you know, in the right. trunk. I remember those power. days. <laughs> it was mounted up right next to the driver's console in the front seat. My boss had hearing issues. He liked it on the speaker. He did not like to have to hold the phone. It was hard for him to do from the back seat. Plus, he just didn't like riding in the back seat. Okay. He dressed very common. Casual, California casual. I wouldn't, he looked more like Columbo. Okay. I mean, it, you would not see him in a crowd and pick him out to be, to have been in, in a picture, in a photograph, in anybody of any importance, special or anything. He didn't try and advertise himself. He didn't try and promote himself. He didn't try, but he was an exceptionally powerful man. Forget going back in time 28 years and mm -hmm. moving and the things that happened to me. If I told you right now, LA, I can take you to exactly where the spear is. Mm. I can give you the spear, you can have it tested, you can do, what would that do? What does that prove? Not what is it evidence of, what does it prove? Mm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that, it, this is gonna to sound totally awful, do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of John F. No. Kennedy? <laughs> Over what is it? Seventy percent of Americans don't believe yeah. that. Here's the rest of now, this is the path. Here's the path. Here's the path. Here's the path. Here's the path. Oh my God! So much closer. Look. Oh, you've got to be kidding me! And the egg is. Oh right here, my we just God! Drove over the egg. Yeah, oh my God! We just drove over the egg. Oh my God! There's the fence. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I'm here. <laughs> oh my gosh! Honey, where should I go? They did the left. They did the left. It's a lot closer than what you think. Yeah. And yet, that's the story that's What have they yeah, ever sure. done about yeah. it? Nothing. Nothing. Right. That, this was again the story I told, that was the final coup to where they knew they had what they wanted as far as control and power. Hmm. When they knew that the, peop the people knew. The stories I could tell you about that, you'd have to have 58 more hours. And about relationships to, to the story that I didn't even know I had until after my father passed away. Hmm. What are you going to do about it? One of the last things my boss ever said to me before I left. He said, Chris, you ought to write all of this as a novel. It'd make a great novel. And I said, yeah, right, like that could ever happen and ever get published. He goes, well, I wouldn't have any problem with it. He said, no one's going to believe it. No one's you. going to believe it anyway, right. Those who are calling themselves the sons of the Nephilim are in possession of the spear. And That's they are they awaiting their man, the Antichrist, to come forward. They already know who he is. What was that? They already know who he is. They, they know who him. He they is. groomed him. They probably groomed five or ten just to make sure that so they... So you believe he's on, on the planet now, perhaps? Yeah. Did your boss ever mention a timeline where we would begin to see some of the things that we've talked about begin to happen? Are we in that window of time now, in your opinion? I mean, my boss told me he wouldn't live to see it. He told me that if I... My life expectancy, I probably wouldn't.
Hey David, how you doing? David, what initially got you interested in the black eyed kids or black eyed children? Well, I had researched the paranormal for a lot of years and in the late 90s I heard a few of these stories. The early days of the internet they showed up. Very interesting, uh, having an interest in all areas of the paranormal. I, I read them and kind of cataloged the information away for future use. But at the time it seemed like this could be urban legend, it could just be, you know, hoaxes. That all changed when I met a gentleman named Paul. Mm. Paul is a former prison guard, martial artist, bodybuilder. I call him a John Wayne character. He's just a no-nonsense, no BS guy. One day having lunch, asked if he could join me. Completely opened up and told me his story. And I, I was pretty stunned. You know, when I got involved in this field in the 70s, he said paranormal and people knew Okay, that kind of includes hauntings, uh, cryptozoology, UFOs, the whole spectrum. Okay. And that's, that's how I have always approached it, as in a holistic manner. I was about two blocks away from my house, you know, on my jog with my iPod. And this is like morning or afternoon? It was afternoon. It was okay. probably, it was actually, I can tell you exactly what time okay. it was. It was um, exactly 517. And that is important because I had been having a reoccurring um, experience with that number. My personal opinion, after researching it for so long, is that these children are some kind of interdimensional being, for lack of a better word. Mm. But I had never seen any children ever on that corner, and I, I was two blocks away, and I was approaching the corner of Hartford and Shepherd, mm -hmm. and there was a boy, he was about 10 years old, kind of striped shirt and baggy black pants, and it kind of looked a little strange. Um, and the other thing that I noted was that he was wearing a yarmulke, which was very typical for that neighborhood. What was he was to the to side, okay. and his head was down. His head was down. Was he wearing a, yeah. and a yarmulke on? Right? And he was okay. wearing a yarmulke, right. yes. So I didn't think anything of it. You know, okay. I'm running, I'm in my zone, I'm going east. And at the last minute as I approached him, I was just a few feet away. You know, I glanced up, and I usually smile hello at people. And that's what I did. I glanced up and he caught me with this very intense look and it was just frightening. Whether they're there all the time and we're just not aware or whether they're able to sort of shift into our reality, maybe that's the case. But they're, the accounts are becoming more widespread. There are more and more of these stories showing up. And there's some kind of an agenda going on. And this was like just the blackest depths that without putting words in your mouth I mean, give me give me a word for what you saw it was just like a cavern of like looking down into a vacant cavern which is like evil at the bottom okay so it's the word the operative word here would be evil yes for okay. sure definitely so i believe that these beings i i don't think they have any good purpose at all it, it's something very sinister mm -hmm. and i believe that they are actually somehow feeding off of that fear. You're not sure, you know, you bolted the scene and you're not sure how he left the scene because obviously, I mean, did you did you do this at least once? No, behind you? You just, no, you just I was so scared, honestly, because I just, he was so evil and I could Have feel it, I could feel it. Have you ever felt fear like this before? Well, not really to that extent. Not to that no, extent. I mean, all my all my hairs were standing right. up. You know, that's typically what happens when I encounter negative energy. Mm -hmm, I do get mm -hmm. the hair standing on end thing going on, but um, I really just was so frightened by the whole thing that my only reaction was to run fast in the other direction and not look back. Mm -hmm. And I didn't look back. Otherwise, I may have seen him vanishing or something. I don't right. know. I want to show you something. Um, this is from a book by a person we're about to interview named David, David Weatherly. And I want you to look at this cover. Did it look something like this? Yes. Uh, uh, uh. When you look at all of these accounts, and there, there are hundreds and hundreds of them at this point, when you look at all these encounters, when this peak of fear is reached in the victim, mm -hmm. the kids are done. They vanish. One of the more disturbing uh, elements of uh, people who encounter these children, I use that in quotation marks because we both think that they're not children or kids, is that these children will say phrases 
which sound almost normal but aren't. Tell us about that. Right. The use of language is, is a whole subject in itself with these manifestations. First of all, most people describe their speech as being very monotone. They say that these kids speak in a very cold manner. Is, How, what can I hear you, is there any way you can, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you imitate that from some of the witnesses that you've talked to? You know, everyone tries to do it and they say that they it doesn't can't really do it. convey right. that, You know, some people say it sounds almost robotic. Okay. Uh, there's almost an implication that they're, they're programmed or that they've memorized a mm -hmm. certain set of phrases mm -hmm. and they will default back to those. You know, they, they won't answer direct questions very often. Uh, they'll simply redirect and repeat a statement. So just let us in. This so here, here's long. a knock on the door, right? <laughs> right. And I right. go, hi kids, can I help you? What do they say? Could be any number of bizarre phrases. Here's one that really uh, kind of creeped me out. Mm -hmm. Is it food time? Mm. No one that's speaks weird. like that. Yeah. That's that's not, you know, it's English language, but it's not a, a normal phrase. So it, it just doesn't fit. Uh, it, is it, I think you should let me in. I think it's food time. Tell us about the story, which is in your book, The Black Eyed Children, um, about the, the man in a pickup truck driving across the state of Texas in the middle of the night. Hands down for me, the creepiest story that I've come across, uh, just because I could sort of identify with it personally. But uh, what happened was this gentleman contacted me, military man. He has family all over Texas. He was uh, visiting family in uh, East Texas, okay. decided he wanted to see some of his relatives in West Texas. And uh, this young man, he likes to drive at night, watch the stars and just kind of buzz across those lonely Texas road. As he's done many times, he takes off got his thermos full of coffee and uh, it's, it's a black night he's driving along these back roads in Texas a lot of times you can hit just long stretches no houses no nothing Your kid? Just let me get in your truck. We can go for a ride. Do you need to get home? Do you live around here? Just open the door and tell me to get in. We'll have a short ride. I don't I don't think so, kid. down the road a little bit, his training starts to kick in. I'm trained military, why am I running from a kid? Mm -hmm. Then he starts thinking logically, maybe this is a kid that really needed help. Hits a U-turn, goes back to the spot, finds the exact spot. Searches with a flashlight, searches everywhere. No sign of this kid anymore. He's looking all around in the distance for any kind of a, a light from a house, mm. an outside light, something. There's nothing. David Weatherly has explored the phenomena of the black eyed kids. This poses the question. Do these children somehow tie back into what we discovered at SEAL Lab with Dr. Roger Lair and Steve Cobra? Is it possible that these children are the results of a breeding program, an abduction phenomenon? Chris Blake believes that there's a group of men on this planet who call themselves the sons of the Nephilim and that they are here to usher in the biblical antichrist in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Bob Williams proved the video we showed him was a hoax. Leah Campen encountered a black-eyed child. Gary Stearman had a close encounter of the second kind. 
Bottom line for me, if you encounter a black eyed kid, don't let him in. video show them actually moving. Look at that. They're taking off from the surface of the moon. And there's people capturing those all over the world. 